Because when I was when I was studying, doing retaking two units in summer, there was it was only me. Everyone else is uh, like on Instagram, Snapchat, enjoying their summer. I was there doing my work by myself. I failed my first year to the point where I think I only had like one thing that let me stay and I had to retake like two or three modules as well. And I'm sat there in the summer on my own as well. <laughs> you know, this, this, I think this speaks to the wider thing of perhaps why me and you are so passionate about kind of spreading <laughs> that knowledge as well further down the line, because we know, we felt it. We felt yeah. that belief that people have in us and what that can do to your future. It's crazy. It's not about being the most talented or the most hardworking because there's people that are way more talented than me there are people that are way more hardworking than I am as well uh, like I've always been around people that are much better than me but it's about people actually seeing what you're doing <laughs> it, it shows right you got the email from yeah. BR Gingle so uh, <laughs> what can you tell us a little bit of juice you know like, I, I, mean, mean, I know there's a lot of confidential stuff yeah I mean what I can say is that the Barbican is massively going to change. I struggle and I don't know if I, maybe this is indirectly like trying to blow my own trumpet. Um, I'm really not trying to, but I, I seldom find people who are as prolific or, you know, I would use the word prolific because it's neither negative or positive, um, <laughs> you know, with their architectural activities at such a young age, um, you know, apart from you, I've seen, I, I, I felt it myself. I've been told by people, oh, Hamza, you're just, how would you do so much and this and that? And I'm like, you know, it's because I got people like you on my radar, like Sean Adams. <laughs> um, so we're going to get into all of it, man. I really want to know your journey. I really want to understand um, how someone goes from, well, how someone at the age, the tender age of 27, I believe, <laughs> uh, has has now landed an opportunity to potentially refurbish the Barbican with mm. Bjork Ingalls. <laughs> so um we want to hear all about that sean don't, don't worry we'll get into that <laughs> and you want to hear the details because you're that's you're, you're doing that at the moment aren't you yeah so yeah we're working with big and avanti architects so yeah it's pretty pretty interesting my my family member works for uh, avanti architects how crazy really? is that yeah my wife's um cousin works for avanti so there's this cause for celebration not just because you're 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 part of this massive major project, <laughs> but, but the family, uh, but someone else, yeah. So yeah, I want to know all about that. Um, I want to know all about your meetings. I want to know the in depth kind of the <laughs> VIP experience. Before we get into all of the exciting stuff and kind of where you are right now with your practice uh, or, or collective or however you define it, the the poor collective, which is doing bits. I'll tell you that, mate. You guys are doing bits. And it's and it's amazing to see. I just saw your thumbnail pop up, and you guys are like <laughs> look like a little boy band. Um, but you guys are the future faces of the profession. Um, where did it all where did it all start, Sean? Well, with, and, with and you can, collective you can answer or... answer that however you want. You can tell um, me about your childhood experiences. You can tell me whatever <laughs> you want. Um, I guess I, I'll start from the beginning because I think um, I, I don't people don't really ask me like. Where do people like where did you start? Everyone kind of just asks, oh, like, or they pick a particular part of my journey. But I think it's kind of important to speak about how everything started. I think like from a kid, I always knew I wanted to get into architecture. I always knew I wanted to be an architect. And I think that's part of the obsession in a way. I think that's where it is, is like having a, a obsession with art, architecture, design, the creative industries. So when I was like, I think the first time I can remember ever wanted to be an architect, I was probably like five. And I was like, yep, I want to be become an architect. Wow. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know why. I was just like, I want to build builders. I want to design things. I mean, as I've kind of grown, um, I think it's not necessarily only about building buildings. But from that age, I knew I wanted to become an architect. Like I was interested in architecture and design. And hold on, hold school, on. <laughs> I'm going to interject. This is what I do. Sorry. So five years old. That's so young, man. I think, but I think for me, like people see me doing all this stuff and they're like, how do you manage to do this stuff? But I'm like, 
when when you like something's your calling like you put everything into it because yeah. i can't remember a time where i've ever wanted to be anything else except to architect so, where did like, that come from though did you have someone in the family did you have did you see a, some sort of video what was the impetus i mean if i'm completely honest i literally just think like I was just born to become an architect in the most like less kind of cliche way because there there wasn't I didn't have any kind of family members that were architects I didn't really have well I didn't have any connections to the architecture industry at all like when I went to university that was the first time I met an architect bear in mind from the age of five to 18 everyone knew I wanted to become an architect but everyone in my direct circle like just didn't have a connection for architect whether it was the school teachers whether it was my family so, so i went through like but where's like, this it has to have come from somewhere someone must unless you 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 know in your sleep somebody did some inception <laughs> stuff and planted that dream in there you know there must have been something you can put your finger on where you say look that's what motivated me or that's what that's when i thought oh architecture's the profession i want to be in i think when i go to the job interviews or people ask me i'd say like I don't know, like going, going into different spaces made me more like aware of the environments that I was in, like growing up, like in my bedroom, like um, I felt as if uh, like I wanted a bigger space, but then when I went outside into our garden, I felt like I had more space. So I was quite aware of like my environments and where I was uh, like from going to school, from going home, from like after school clubs to like youth clubs. Like I was always really aware of like my environment, the changes that were happening around me. But I think from quite a, a, a young age, like my parents put like mega blocks, Lego, all of the kind of obvious stuff in front of me. Um, and I would just, like really intuitive I always wanted to make things um and I think I've got to give a lot of credit to my parents because and and like my family because I would say that quite a lot of my family members are quite creative but um I like they they didn't go and pursue any of those kind of uh, that creativity and use it um to to like a four-year extent in a way I think they went on to do kind of more practical things and the fact that most of my kind of family came from the Caribbean and came over here there wasn't really opportunity for them to pursue creative industries or like you yeah. come over here you work you kind of um build build money like buy a house there wasn't this become an artist become a creative become an architect so I think I was quite fortunate to be able to say to my family I want to be an architect and I was like go for it like mm -hmm. here here's these here's, this, here's some tools to play with it's really fascinating. I've I've never I've never heard of someone so young having that realization because I usually ask people this question when they start, and you know it. it I usually see one of two or three answers, and it's you know one is um, they see someone in their family or uh, or someone close to them who's an architect, and they think, okay, that's what I want to do. The other thing is they might see a movie or something in in the kind of um, the the mainstream media space um which could also have something to do with a book or you know they get fascinated with you know um a movie and they think oh well what job is the job that designs those cities or those those yeah. buildings and it's oh it's architecture but there's another one that actually uh one of my previous guests jordan whitewood neil who, who was a close friend of mine and doing amazing things in the profession as well that he had um and and a few others and to some degree myself as well and now I'm hearing you, which is this third kind of impetus, which is it's much more of kind of a phenomenological uh, kind of uh, trigger that when you're a kid, there's something to do with the environment or the space that you have a deep connection with and Definitely. realizing that there's an issue or there's a certain level of power that is within the spaces that you occupy and therefore if you can have control over the spaces and the and 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 programming and designing those spaces then you can change stuff and you can yeah. you can make stuff happen mm. it sounds like that's what you said i mean pretty much i always just thought architects have the power to change everything around us from the pavement to the entire city and i was kind of always intrigued by like how how are they able to to do so much like how do they have so much power in the city? So um, you said you said you were aware of the environment. Yeah. What was your environment like? What what was it about your environment that made you aware of it? 
I think because I grew up in South London and when I was growing up, the area that I was, because I grew up in Mitcham and in like during the time that I was growing up, there was quite a lot of um, like gang culture and gang r- rivalry happening in my area. So I think you had to be like quite streetwise and you had to be quite aware of your surroundings all the time because you had to, you had to know like when things are happening, like where not to go. And I think that kind of, being like street and having to be kind of aware of your surroundings like okay you're leaving late this might happen like who is that over there like it always made me really kind of um look around and always be like really um like ob- or like really observe my surroundings and i think anyone from from like uh, environments like that will be able to tell you you're always street street like you're so streetwise you're so alert any movement you're kind of you're seeing that like if you've got to go down a narrow alleyway like you already realized that 10 minutes before you've even gone to the alleyway or like if you see like a small like a a wide open space you're like this is perfect because I know loads of people can see me and and I think these these are the kind of things that a lot of people um like in their everyday lives they'll be they'll also be thinking about like if you're coming home late you might be thinking oh it's dark um but then obviously there might be certain other things that might um kind of contribute to you to, to perceive your environment in certain ways but I think for me from quite a young age, I had to be really like aware, and I think that just that um, that awareness just continued as I got older. That is so fascinating. It's like I mean, a, a dissertation could be written just on this: <laughs> the parallels between uh, kind of being street smart and uh, almost like architectural or urban analysis. Um, you know, it's it's fascinating to hear that. You know, I, I can relate to some degree because I was I was born and raised in East London in 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 I was actually in a nice area that was within <laughs> a, a somewhat questionable I mean every area in London is has got <laughs> has got question marks around <laughs> it so um yeah no I definitely I definitely can relate to the idea of of knowing that you know based on the lighting based on yeah. the um the condition of the urban environment uh based on the um location of specific specific places and buildings and and the way that the perhaps even the way the street is designed you know mm-hmm. dead ends and yeah. um you know high high gate high fences and things like that that there is a level of danger associated with different yeah. spaces it's, it's the first time i'm ever thinking about it so it's it's amazing um kind of uh, it's an amazing kind of thought for you to open up um but i don't want to get too caught up in those details let, let, let's keep the story going in terms of you know your journey so very early age you realize architecture's for you now now what was your education like sort of primary school were you naughty were you, were you smashing it what was going on <laughs> um I think I've, when I was in school I was always trying to be the, the, the class clown like I was always messing around like anyone that knows me knows that I kind of like to make jokes so I went to a school in my area um, and I was kind of doing quite badly. So my mom moved me into uh, uh, a secondary, I mean, a primary school that she was actually teaching in. So <laughs> when I was there, I kind of quickly, <laughs> I mean, I still I still ended up in quite a bit of trouble, but my mom was there. So um, like, it wasn't too bad. But I think because like, I wasn't necessarily bad, but I was always kind of messing around. Um, like I was always asking questions from a young age. And I think a lot of ch- like, Um, teachers just simply wanted me to accept the answer but I always used to be like oh but why are we doing this like what's the importance of this why do we need to do this and I think it aggravated quite a lot of them so I spent a lot of the time getting sent out like um, (laughs) being an isolation worker by myself Um, but then I think what was what was kind of good about learning that is that to understand the time when's the right time to ask questions when's the right time to to um, do these things like not in the middle middle of class are you asking why are we doing this you might wait until the end and then you say miss why are we doing this I didn't understand this um so I quickly learned that when I went into secondary school um which I feel like was a slightly different experience um but yeah I think I think in primary school it was it was a bit fragmented because I didn't like spend my whole time I think in total I might have been to three three primary different primary schools so yeah it was a bit a bit fragmented (laughs) Wow. And, you know, architecture is not a certain subject, especially when we were going to school, because we're we're pretty much the same age. Um, You know, architecture is not a subject which you see down in the education systems. uh, So, you know, so early on, you're definitely not in primary school education. I've I've heard of very few people who've 
who've understood or got exposure to the field of architecture at that level of their education. So it always begs the question. And I think, you know, we always ask each other, our generation of, oh, what did you do in your GCSEs? And, um, you know, I, I, I know you are also very passionate about looking at pathways into architectural university education and, and kind of looking at where those boundaries are for people in perhaps um, areas which aren't as well off and, and, and also just in general in the schooling system. So kind of, you know, playing with, with, with those issues as well, where do you kind of, um, well, I suppose, did you get exposed to architecture anyway, or were you in the artistic kind of mode at school at all? Um, so when I went into secondary school, bear in mind, I knew from primary school I wanted to be an architect. I was trying to say to teachers, but then at those point, even my, like my parents would have been saying to teachers as well, he wants to become an architect. By that point, they're just like, okay, do like your sets. So like do these examinations. Don't worry yet. Like when you get into secondary school, then that's the time to start thinking about career. You like, he's way too young to be thinking about all of these things. But then when I go into secondary school, I continued and I was continuously continuously saying, oh, I want to become an architect. I want to um, get into architecture. But my school just didn't. They just did, had no kind of relationship with architects or, or anyone really from the built environment. So I remember when I was doing my work experience, I had asked if I could work at our architecture office. The school were just like, well, we don't know any architects. We can't put you in contact with any architects. I think everyone, pretty much all, my, all the people in my year went into some kind of retail based work experience but then I had my mom had spoken to my uncle and my uncle was working for a maintenance company um for for Lambeth so Lambeth is a a borough in 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 London so I I actually got to go to the maintenance company and spend two weeks there and I mean that's still not architecture I mean I got to go to buildings I got to see like a lift shaft get installed I got to go on a roof but that was the closest thing to architecture like my school couldn't help me at all like my uncle would pull in loads of strings so I got to work in the in the maintenance company I mean I was just doing spreadsheets but he took me on site once and that was great <laughs> but literally checking people's boilers and checking like a new a development What's your conception of architecture at this age? Because you, you you sound like you were pestering everyone, like, uh, <laughs> let, let me be an architect, let me be an architect. But, <laughs> but you know, my, my understanding certainly has changed of what an architect is and who who what architecture is in general. What was your conception of architecture at that young age? I mean, I did you know of any architects, like famous architects? At that age, I didn't know any architects because you got to think, this is like before like the internet it was how it is now so it wasn't like I could just go go on google and be like famous architect so I would have to get someone to gift me like an architecture (laughs) architecture book and normally no one that like immediately around me knows anything about architecture so they're getting me books that they think relate to architecture but in hindsight they're just like (laughs) building books like they're nothing really to do about architecture just okay this interesting building or like this kind of travel guide kind of book so for me, I just thought architects just design everything. Like I just, I was still thinking they design bridges, um, buildings. They craft the city. I, I was thinking at that age that the architects that like sitting with the prime minister or the president, are like yeah, like the massive overseer, like we're gonna put that building here, that building here. I mean, I quickly learned that's not the case um, as as I kind of went to university. But at the time, I just thought that like, the architect is a master puppeteer, just like okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. Um, but it's not it's but, not far off the the modernist era of of what architects yeah. <laughs> were able to do. Um, and I mean, yeah, well, it wasn't too far. And and there's a there's a there's a I mean. I, I, I was expecting an answer like this and I'm glad to hear it because there's a level of, I suppose, you know, maybe it's a, it's a juvenile conception of what architecture is, but it's also, um, it's also true to what my understanding of architecture is now, which is crazy, isn't it? Mm. It okay. is an extremely broad field that you can essentially, you know, you have the scope, we have the skills to be able to design a bridge, to be able to, to, to design the urban environment, to design a building. And I feel like, although that was a child thinking that's what architecture is, I feel like as we progress in this field, we have, we're seeing that architecture is much more than just designing buildings. Yeah, literally. But then I feel like when I went to university, I felt like some of that understanding started to get rewired a little bit because I had this 
this massive idea of what architect was and then when i started going to university i was like oh so architect just architect just really building the buildings uh, but as like as i kind of gone through my studies i've kind of gone back to to some of the things that i originally thought architect was and i think yeah i think an architect is kind of like a master designer and you know what's crazy as well it's like what you're saying is made me realize that you know some of the most successful architects the world has ever seen and uh, one of them uh, of the most famous of our era is someone you're now working with which is crazy uh Bjork Ingels um you know they often when they describe their come up and they also they talk about their ethos it often is quite a childish kind of understanding of architecture and maybe not childish in the in the kind of negative sense but more in the sense that it's a, it's a simple very very straightforward foundational understanding of architecture and a very generalist idea of architecture it's not over complicated you know for zaha it's about the curves for bjork ingels it's about perhaps it's about the uh, the blocks and the quirkiness is the quirkiness you can create with just you know playing with blocks um and i feel like uh, th- there's a level of simplicity in understanding architecture that is is at its core is the most truthful way of understanding it yeah. but anyway before we before we get too philosophical with things so you're now you know you're what are you actually studying for your gcses and your a levels or did you did you not do those so for my gcses like again i was asking the, the teachers like what 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 skills do i need as an architect like what subjects do i need to study and I think this, the teachers were kind of out of their depth and they were like, maths and physics. Like, you need maths and physics. Um, so for, for A-levels, I did maths, physics, philosophy, um, and ethics and 3D product design because I was like, okay, product design, I'm sure that kind of sounds like architecture because I didn't really know. And I didn't have anyone to ask, like, what subject should I, should I take? Like, what routes are there into the profession? So I just kind of went with what people were saying. I think that, like, I think that makes sense. And then, yeah. So, um, in hindsight, I mean, physics was a complete disaster. <laughs> so I probably should have tried to avoid that. Um, and yeah, three D product design, <laughs> like, it, <laughs> and it, they didn't really help. If I'm completely honest, when I went to university, uh, like, it was completely different to to my A levels. Yeah. So it's like you know often often we speak about now of like the roots into architecture mm. and um people often have that same story of like oh you need to do physics you need to do geography yeah. you need to do this and it's the, the reason it's so confusing is because of the reason we just said you know no it's not fully understood yeah, you know exactly. well it's also actually architecture deals with everything so you know if if you said physics if you said chemistry which seems completely unrelated I'm sure somebody could find some application of chemistry yeah. with architecture. So it does beg the question of, you know, how early should architecture students be exposed or students in general be exposed to this field? You know, at a young age, people are being exposed to, you know, the jobs of, you know, financial jobs and lawyers and doctors. But how how early do people actually find out that architecture is possible as a field? I mean, that's changed a lot since yeah. when we were at school right but yeah. what do you think needs to needs needs to keep changing in that area i think well to kind of before i answer the question i think to add a bit of context to like my school um i went to school in mitcham and then i went to school in um so that's southwest london then i went to school in wandsworth so that's also in southwest london um and the majority of people from both of those schools were from like working class backgrounds. Um, so when you kind of think about the school, the school itself is trying to get the students, push the students towards getting those, st- do, getting the, like studying those STEM subjects. So like the sciences, the maths, because those are the, those are the um, supposedly the subjects that are of value when it comes to kind of like the statistics, but the more creative subjects like art. And I mean, in my school, I think art and music would, and 3D product design before they scrapped that were like the only creative subjects. So they were ma- pushing everyone towards those subjects. And then even saying that growing up, it was kind of like the, the only, the only kind of jobs that you could get is you could become a lawyer, you could become a doctor. Um, 
I mean, you could, well, academically, yeah, it was either lawyer, doctor, or do something with finance. Um, and I mean, finance and business came much later. And then the other options was like, you become a musician. Like, so there wasn't, re- or you become a footballer. So there wasn't really many options. <laughs> Like growing up, like it would th- those are kind of your options, and if you weren't good at those things, then but then for some reason, people would get behind architecture, they'll be like, Oh, yeah, architects make loads of money. Like, I don't know, I don't know off the back of what <laughs> what they thought architect made money from because no one actually knew an architect, but those were the kind of um, those were the kind of things. So, but I think because because of that, because of the schools only want a student to pursue like the more academic subjects. I think they lost out in in trying to create opportunities for for young people and the students to to explore different avenues. Because for me, I think I think art, music, three D, um, tech, technology, all those subjects should be there from the start because I think they're really stimulating uh, creative subjects, and I think that would allow students to start thinking that there's other jobs or the other kind of um, avenues instead of just focusing on like being a lawyer, being a doctor. Because I know a lot of people that pursued those, um, went to pursue their careers off the back of thinking there's nothing else that they could pursue. And they quickly found out that this isn't their passion and they, and, and they either dropped out of university or they ended up get, like getting their degree and just not feeling fulfilled. And I think it, it's really, it's really sad because, as a child, you're super impressionable. And if someone's to say to you, okay, I don't know, a doctor and a lawyer are more valuable than any other c- kind of profession. I mean, I think I think it, it can really make you kind of look down at, at other, other professions. Yeah, 100%. I love what you said about the footballer thing because I grew up around <laughs> that environment too where, you know, a footballer is a job prospect way before architecture. Yeah. Would be. <laughs> maybe it's just maybe it's just the nature of being in London. I think you get that everyone everyone's trying to be a footballer, isn't it? Literally, is is is, is if, if it's not a footballer, rapper, <laughs> or something uh, yeah. academic, they're not really they don't really have much options. <laughs> so, hey, but you know what? It's always useful that on my CV I do have great football skills and I can rap. So. <laughs> One day that'll come to use. Um, so, okay, so let's go next step. So what about the entry into university? What was that like? Um, yeah, that, I mean, that was, that was a roller coaster um, because I think my, the, school that, the school I went to was, there was only two years above me at the time. So they, so they were still working a lot of things out. So at the time when I was there, I think we had one person come in to tell us about university. And it looked like this was like a student that maybe one of the tutors must have came across at the pub or something. Because I remember the guy telling us, oh, yeah, you could get a bus that would take you to uni and it'll cost a pound. And in hindsight, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, hold on, this guy should have been telling us stuff like UCAS, <laughs> the, the, the grading system, like the different types of grades that you get at university, like the units. He didn't tell us any of that. I remember getting to university and thinking, what's all this? <laughs> like, and I remember the only thing that we really got help with was the personal statement. Other, otherwise, everything else felt like it was like... It no was help, really. it's a myth as well. You know, if you don't get yeah. that explained to you and even, even I suppose, even after I eventually got into uni out of a miracle... Um, I still didn't know what the hell UCAS was. It was such a myth. <laughs> so where, where, where did you end up going uni? So I went to the University of Portsmouth because um, I, I was quite lucky because one of my friends, one of my closest friends was was playing. Well, he, he, had, he wasn't starting. He was a reserve um, for Portsmouth FC. So I was like, well, if he's going to be there, well, I'm going to, I'm going to go there as well. And then two of my, two of my friends said that they're also going down to Portsmouth. So I was thinking, yeah, perfect. I've got some people that I can kind of, um, go to Portsmouth where could it, obviously this is the first time I'm, I'm going to be away from my parents, leaving London. So it's like super daunting. I remember because I went, I applied for the Montfort in less and yeah it's in Leicester yep yeah, it's in Leicester um Ravensbourne which I'm actually quite fortunate 
Um, because I think at the time their course wasn't actually RIBA accredited, so I, I think I might have dodged a bullet there. <laughs> I mean, now it is accredited, so not to throw them under the bus, but at no, the no, time, I've heard I've heard people who struggled with that, yeah, yeah. So at the time, so I was either going so Leicester was kind of like, well, I've got no connection, is a it, like there's no one, there's no one that I know there, is 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 like quite a few hours away, so I was kind of like, no, but in Portsmouth, I was like, perfect, this is the perfect place um, for me to go, because I know if if I feel uncomfortable, I've got, like, a few of my friends that I can kind of fall back on. Yeah, so, you know, what was University of Portsmouth like? What was your part one like? Um, you know, I'm trying to kind of gauge, I'm trying to build your your picture, you know, for <laughs> from, and it's very scary, because we have, we have a very similar background, and, uh, <laughs> and kind of, um, you know, even the with the way you're describing what you were like at school and like the obstacle, it all felt very, it all feels very similar to me, um, and and I suppose I'm trying to kind of figure out when does the poor collective stuff start bubbling up in your head. You know, uh, early on for me in my university in my foundation, I knew I wanted to start a brand. You know, this two worlds concept was like really this deep philosophical kind of concept to me that I wanted to like get it onto a uh, you know, manifest it as a uh, as a design brand. So I started a clothing line, and uh, you know, blah blah blah. So what was it for you? Like, w- was there an entrepreneurial bug deep down in there? W- where did the poor collective come from? I mean, I think I think like throughout my whole time in in primary school, secondary school, I've always like had things to say. Like, I always want to say something or add something, whether it's kind of like a joke or. Or I want to show people things. Um, and I think also during this during this whole process, I was going to youth clubs in my area. So I was meeting other people in my area, meeting other people from schools. Um, and I was speaking to people that are not that much older than me, maybe five, 10 years older. And they were like, they were upskilling me. Like they were showing me how to, to speak. They were like showing me how to conduct myself, how to behave. Um, but also like just teaching me quite basic skills that okay you need to do this you need to do that a lot of things that I was not learning like in school like just how to navigate through life and I think from being around so many people like that I started to get like a entrepreneurial mindset and I was kind of like I want to do my own thing like I don't like and I've got good ideas and I've always thought I've had good ideas from like a kid I thought no this is a good idea and even if people might be like, no, I don't think that's a good idea. I've been thinking, you know what? It is a good idea. Or people might say to me, I don't think you can do that. I think people have always said to me, you can't do this. You can't do that. But I've, I've always thought, you know, I can do it. Just because you can't do it. I get like, I'll show you. I'll show you I can do it. So there's always been something that's been kind of in my mind. Um, and I think that also um, that kind of feeling of, of like, trying something new come stems from the fact that I didn't have anyone I didn't know anyone that was an architect so every 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 step of my life I'm pretty much doing something that I haven't seen anyone immediately around me doing so I'm kind of used to being the first person to do this the first person to um go to university uh like first person to go to university at London first person to um try to start up this business or try and do this because like I've not seen anyone do it but I'm not gonna like, I'm not going to stop myself. I'm going to yeah. try and dive in. And if it if it works, it works. If it fails, it fails. Um, so I've always kind of felt like, you know what, let me try this. Let me do it. Let me do this and see what happens. And so where, where did it come from? Because the poor collective is a very specific thing, right? So what? how did it actually start? Was it an idea that you had in university? Was it just this natural thing where you found like-minded people and you were like, hey, should we start a little practice type thing and try and build stuff together? Um, I think I think it will. I would have to first say it probably started the idea, but before like in on my end of poor kind of came from the youth club aspect. So like, um, I was going to these youth clubs when I was growing up. I was always kind of going to them. They were like my outlet. Um, but then at some point, like in in London across the UK, when the funding started getting stripped, there were less of these youth kind of. Um, like youth support, youth um, led organizations, community centers were closing down. And I really felt that because I was someone that's going to all these centers all the time. Um, my, like my parents would know me, other, like know other people, parents in the community. Like this is how I would meet other people like f- from the youth clubs. And then I'll be coming home from school and I'll see them on the bus. So I always like, I got a lot from these youth centers. But then when they started closing down, I was like, what's like, 
there's something missing. Like, and going back to what I said about the people older, I always saw people older giving back to, to my community. So like, you know what? I've always thought I wanted to do something. I would love to run my own youth club or have my own youth center. And I think when I went to Portman University, I met Matt and Larry. So they're two of the other co-founders of, of a poor collective. But what's quite funny is Larry lives like opposite, like opposite me. And I didn't know for years. But then when we when we started connecting, we realized that we have so many mutual friends. But I went to a school outside of our, our area in Wandsworth while he lived uh, and went to school in Mitcham. And we would always have these deep conversations like, man, the youth clubs, like all these youth facilities are closing. And then obviously we'll be talking about architecture as well and be like, no, like, like we should be like, I wish we could do something. So and this is just though, you two, you two at uni, like, you know, when you're socializing, you're just, this is what you're, you're obviously finding that you have the same passions and you're studying the same thing and you both feel really strongly about what's happening in your local area. Yeah, li- literally, we'll be thinking like, man, w- why are all these youth clubs closing? And then Matt, who who um like he's doing accountancy and finance, he like he's not doing anything remotely uh like close to architecture. He's saying the same thing. He's saying, look, like we need more opportunities for young people. And we just kept having these conversations. We didn't know that we were gonna eventually kind of create something. It wasn't until like we went to the RCA. So Larry w- start, started studying at the the Royal College of Art a year before me. And he had met Ben. So he's, he's one of the other co-founders as well. So he, him and Ben were having these same conversations uh, like a year before I joined. And then when I joined um, the RCA, we're still having the conversations, still having the conversations. Um, but we didn't actually know what we wanted to do. Um, like we're having these conversations. We were kind of like starting to get more involved with youth-led organizations. We we're trying to do more work, creating access into architecture. But we were doing all of these things under a lot of other companies um, and a lot of big organizations were like really benefiting from the work that we were doing. And it got to it got to a point where so what, what like, work were you actually doing? So you were you were reaching out to organizations that were perhaps running workshops like artistic or creative yeah. workshops for schools. So, yeah, so when I so even before at the RCA, when I was still at the University of Portsmouth, me and Larry we did a term in in a school local to Portman University where we taught the students about architecture. So that was our kind of first experience. So we would go there, I think it was every Friday for a term. We'll organize workshops ourselves. We would um, plan everything ourselves. We would like get the students to do stuff. And this is when we're in our third year of architecture. So we, <laughs> we're still developing our kind of architectural skills, but we thought, you know what? We know enough already to teach younger people so th- i mean this is something for everyone that like, don't feel as if you can't like teach other people because the the skills that you have are really really powerful so even when we were third you're like you know what let's start doing that. and it just continued we kept off of that we really enjoyed it so we started like looking for opportunities to go into schools so we would go into schools all the time we'd do workshops um but then we were like you know what we're doing all these workshops with it we're kind of um doing all this stuff why don't we do it for ourselves because we're doing it for loads of organization like why don't we do something ourselves because we got ideas and we think we can do things in a different way amazing so then the business started or then the uh the activity started like what 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 was the trigger for you guys to say okay we're going to call it poor collective because what is that even why is it called poor collective and why is it capitalized po <laughs> and capital r and um, capital so, r <laughs> so we we were quite we were quite fortunate because um myself and larry at the time we were um going we're on a program at the stephen lawrence charitable trust um so we were really fortunate to be on this program and at the time the head of program with this amazing guy neil onions who who's who to this day is still our mentor and hope to cut like continue to be our mentor forever um he would like really help us and like he would be a mentor to us giving us opportunities telling us about stuff and he would see like the passion that would have got like doing these workshops and doing all these things and then I remember he was like you guys should you guys like should set something up and he would be like yeah like maybe we should set something up and I remember we were kind of like playing around with it but we weren't really too serious and then I remember Neil was like so guys have you set up your organization yet I've got this project that I want you guys to be on like it would be great if you guys could like come up with a name for yourself I think what we realized is that as we were going to more workshops and doing more stuff people were asking 
oh, who are these guys? Um, and it was just like, oh, this is Sean from, I don't know, this university. And it was like, we needed to formalize what we were doing more. Um, so it couldn't just be, oh, we're just this random student. Um, and then I remember Neil just kind of saying, guys, you need to go for it, go for it, go for it. And then me, Larry, at the time, Alpha, who was with us, um, Ben and, and Matt, we were just like, we're still having these conversations, conversations. But then we started thinking, you know what, let's go for it. And then we started coming up with names. And I thought from like our, our backgrounds and like growing up in working class um, environments, um, like we wanted to have a play on words. So we knew that we wanted the name to be an acronym, but we didn't know what that acronym would mean. Um, but we wanted it to be something that had like a negative connotation, but then we have a positive spin to it. Um, so we were playing around with loads of different names. And I remember, i got to give credit to Larry. I remember Larry was like, poor. And I was like, poor? I'm like, you know what? I like poor. Poor, poor sounds good. Because by that time, we didn't, we didn't necessarily have know what the each letter would stand for. So we're like, you know what, poor? Like, we can play on the idea of being poor, but then we're going to be like, we'll have a twist. And I remember we're going through the acronyms. So we're like power out of, okay, what could, what, what could it be? Power, um, potential, um, polarizing. Like we're going through loads of different names. I just remember when Larry said power out of restriction, that was it. It was, it was over like a moment of enlightenment. We're like, yeah, we're going for it. We're going for it. But then the problem was we loved it. But then we would say it to people before we had formalized. The people were like, poor, poor, what? And then people would just start laughing. People would completely start laughing like, poor, who would ever give you any work? That's rubbish, like poor. And then, you know, people will make the cheesy joke, poor collective. Oh, when you do well, you'll be rich collective. Ha 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 ha. And <laughs> like, we will spend so much time, people like kind of laughing at our name. But then when we were saying to people, power out of restriction, because we're taking um, the word poor and we're flipping it, um, and we're trying to empower communities where we're trying to break the kind of mold of or, and the restriction that society may have put on a certain group of people. I want to break the mold and like, we don't want there to be restriction. We want there to be access to the creative subjects. We want a, any, a young person to see things and believe that they can, they can do that. When we started telling people that, they were like, oh, okay, okay, okay. They still made jokes. <laughs> they still made it jokes, is. but they... <laughs> It's incredibly poetic, I must say. It is it is beautiful because, you know, the word poor itself is such a loaded word. You know, what is poor? It's it's it can have, like you said, it can have a negative connotation to it, but it is a state that people find themselves in. Mo many people find themselves in, and you know, I've I'm no, I wasn't, I don't think I was ever poor, but you know, I've I've been in environments, I've known people who have had issues in that sense and and being in, in impoverished areas and I've I've felt that I've seen it for sure and in some ways weirdly enough I feel like I you know when you're in those communities and around those people you you develop that mindset as well now it is incredibly positive um what I feel from you you know the idea that you 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 must recognize that yes your scenario is a bit shit Maybe you are in a place where you don't have the opportunities or you feel like you don't you don't get the chances and there's no there's no exposure to the things that people from like, uh, you know, who are going to eat and stuff are getting. So what what are you left with? And mm. and I feel like what you're what you're left with is two options. One is resentment mm. and a level of anger that does not help you in any way and a level of kind of almost anarchy that you feel like you need to take the system down and destroy everything and maybe give up and i've seen people i have friends who were like they were they were coming up with me you know and then something happened and it was too much for them and and you know there's this other thing they are the, your, your other option though which is you feel that because of your circumstance not sorry not because of it but as you know well yeah because of it because of your circumstance and the fact that you have all these restrictions and constraints around you that in of itself is the motivating factor to say look how i can get out of that and look how i can prove or break the mold like you're saying 
And I feel so strongly, I feel that concept so strongly. And I feel like it defines a lot of what I do as well. Mm. Um, and it's it's a message that I think sometimes gets gets lost in a way because, mm. you know, that's amazing, right? That's beautiful. And I know you also work in, in areas of talking about equality and opportunities and things like that. And uh, if, you've, if you've seen any of my podcasts previously, you, you, you'll know that I struggle to really kind of wrap my head around how to feel about these wider political kind of issues and the kind of the structural and the systematic issues that are being talked about a lot. Mm. I want to kind of get your two cents on that because, you know, that concept of recognizing that, yes, there are people in life who have it, un- who have it unfair and life is unfair. Sometimes you're dealt a bad hand and there's a, there's a, there's a massive wad of people in this country who have started from a place that is very, very difficult to make any, anything of yourself. And if we want to do the bigger hindsight, there's people who are perhaps like in Yemen and, 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 and other places in the world where they're, they're, they're in the worst scenarios you could possibly imagine let alone, oh, I didn't get the right opportunities in GCSEs. So, yeah. you know, with all of these things going on in my head, I feel like that we should really be thinking and we should really be feeling that despite, that's the word I was looking for, that did not, not because, but despite all these problems and restrictions and constraints, we can be empowered. And it starts from the individual. And as much as communities help us and this and that, if you don't have that inner kind of confidence and feeling of I can do it (laughs) and I'm not just going to do it because I want to do it. I'm going to do it because I want to show. And Mm. I don't know if that's the wrong thing to have because that shows an insecurity if you're trying to show people extrinsically what you can do. But I would be lying. And by the sounds of it, you would be lying if none of your success and your future success was down to the insecurity of being able to show people what you're made of. What's your relationship to all of this? I think, I think you're right when you say like, you've really got to believe in yourself. And I think that's where it all starts. Cause I think people might look on like LinkedIn or social media and think, oh, he's doing all these great things. But then you've got to remember or like even if people don't like didn't know me but like before before like I don't know a few like two years ago or what whatever I think like there were times where like when I was at the University of Portsmouth like I failed two of my units I had to retake two of my units in summer when everyone else had passed and like I was that like I had so much work to do and like there's I remember the whole like the whole time in my first year like my projects were just like really bad like my um my work was like really bad like people would laugh in some of the crits about my work like I remember submitting my work people thinking yeah you're not making it I mean people saying to me like are you sure you want to become an architect <laughs> like like but then I inside me I knew that I w- I wanted to become an architect like people were just kind of saying like are you sure like things aren't really looking too good I remember in summer resubmitting my work like and looking at my grades like I think I got for the first my first year I pretty got I think I pretty much got 40 so I got like a third in my first year and like obviously that hurts massively like you got loads of people kind of laughing at you um people not believing in you but then I like it's kind of about perspective because despite that I still had like, my family that thought keep going like I still knew I wanted to become an architect so like the next the next year instead of kind of getting bogged down by all of this, like, I'll let you know what, I'm going to smash this. Like, I'm going to smash this. And I think that's something that's super important. It doesn't matter how bad you're doing, like, how, how like, how good someone else might be doing. You've got to focus on yourself and work on yourself. Because in, sec- in, in my second year, I think I got six, I think I got five firsts. So I went from getting 40, so, like, all, all borderline fails, in my first year to pretty much getting all firsts in, in, in my second year. And because I had so many firsts in my third year, I only needed to get one first to get a first overall. So you could change things. So when I see people that are struggling, I don't think, oh, you can't be an architect or you're going to like, like, I don't know, this might not be for you. I don't think you got to, you got to look at yourself and you got to work hard for you. Because that's what's gonna give you that burning passion. That's what's gonna give you that drive. Because when I was when I was studying, doing retaking two units in summer, there was it was only me. 
Everyone else is uh, like on Instagram, Snapchat, enjoying their summer. I was there doing my work by myself. By myself. Think how sad I was feeling. Yeah, I don't have to I don't have to think, Sean, because <laughs> I was exactly the same. <laughs> it's so scary how similar it's, our journey is. Well, I'm telling you, sometimes, because I feel like sometimes, like if the building yourself back up is when you really hit that kind of low what the way you'll build your back your, yourself up like you'll never want to be back in that position like yeah what was it what was that turning point because i, I, I i'm literally lost for words of how as if i'm talking to myself here i'm i'm so sorry but <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's 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 crazy how similar this this the story is because um i failed my first year to the point where i think i only had like one thing that let me stay and i had to retake like two or three modules as well and i'm sat there in the summer on my own as well <laughs> uh redoing it's horrible this. it's horrible and then when i got it out and got it in i still i had no motivation after that but then you know, i've said it on other podcasts but it was just a phone call with my brother and no one to this point had really kind of I don't know. I, I, no, I didn't feel like not anyone believed in me up until this point. And it was just this really strange moment where, you know, no judgment, nothing. But my brother was on the phone to me and he was just like, we were kind of like discussing why thing, where things had gone wrong and maybe what the next steps were and, you know, what I'm going to do. And he just goes, my oldest brother, he just goes, why don't you just get first? And I was like, I didn't even go. I didn't even go. What? What do you mean? Me? Me? Have you seen? Do, do you know who I am? It, uh, it was just this like moment of no judgment and just somebody who's like, I know you've got it in you. You just have to make that decision to switch it on. And the weirdest thing happened. I was like, all right, I'll get a first. And everything changed from that moment on. And, you know, it's similar to what you're saying. And, you know, this, this, I think this speaks to the wider thing of perhaps why me and you are so passionate about kind of spreading that knowledge as well further down the line, because we know, we felt it. We felt yeah. that belief that people have in us and what that can do to your future. It's crazy. And, and, and that's, I bet that's why you go back to these schools and why you are you're part of initiatives and collectives that aim to empower people and then aim to kind of bring whatever value you can to people who who are not able to go and get that value literally because i think a lot of people assume that the person that is like doing well in university is the person that's really passionate but you like i think you, you got to distinguish passion between like what like someone that's just kind of doing the task because there could be someone that's super passionate but they just haven't kind of it hasn't all clicked yet they don't quite know what to do and I remember I think to this day one of the reasons that I'm like I'm so methodical in the way that I I, I work is like when I had the first meeting about how how I failed like one of my units so badly I remember the head of year literally sitting down with me and going and going through what I need to do and saying look you need to be able to do these things to show that you understand this this piece of, 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 of kind of the guidelines. And I was thinking, wow, I actually didn't know this. And it was like, it was so simple. She's like, you need to do this. You haven't done this. You haven't done this. Like, this is what we need to, you actually need to do. And after that, like my, like every time I, I get a brief or get a piece of work, I'm trying to understand what is it that I actually have to do? Like, what is the work that I need to do? And I think that's what made the second year and the third year, like really easy. Cause they're like, what do I actually need to do? Am I putting my energy in the wrong thing? Like, am I understanding something wrong? And if I'm understanding something wrong, is there someone that I can go and get the support from? Can someone kind of help me? Like, you don't need to do everything yourself. Like, you're not the first person to ever study architecture, the first person to, like, design a building or first person to do something. There'll be people out there to help you. And I think, for me, it was, like, understanding I've got this passion, but I need to direct my energy in the right, in the right areas and actually focus. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, and then after everything just clicks. So that's why I go back into schools, because I think a lot of the times teachers will see someone that's kind of like messing around in class or 
or um, like is underachieving, but there's probably a reason for that. Like someone isn't going nat- to like naturally completely under underachieve. If they're messing around, there, there might be something happening in in their home. Maybe they don't relate to the teacher, and that's exactly why we work with like kids that are maybe not in mainstream school or kids that have kind of been chucked out because they have things going on. And when you get that thing to click with like, and they can transfer all the energy that they've been putting into other areas, they're the people that you just see kind of completely rocket. They, they excel further than, than others. Yeah. It's, it's incredible, man. I'm trying not to just spin everything on myself, which I feel, I feel like I have been doing. It's just, it's just unreal. I mean, we need to meet up and, and have a, have a <laughs> coffee and something anyway, mate. Um, let, let's get into the actual kind of the, the, the belly of Paul, Paul Collective now. So you guys met, you guys had your, your moment of realization that, you know, we can make this a, an established thing. We can, we can generate some, some services and um, this could be a success. So, you know, walk me through the kind of, you know, briefly how things start to roll in and, and how can you now end up? I mean, how long has it been since Poor Collective started? Two years now. So it's still very, very early. And, 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 and I suppose just by the mere fact that you've organized yourselves as a group, that mm. in of itself unlocks a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And is it a trade? Is it a registered business now? So we're, I mean, at the moment we're, we're a, a social enterprise. So we're, we're a partnership, which we disclaimer for everyone. You shouldn't probably should not ever want to get into be like a partnership, but we're going to change. We're going to change to a, um, a LLP. Let's get a quick business lesson then to talk, talk us through what, why and what, why partnership is not a good idea. Cause I've had so, experience here as well, but. So a partner, typically, typically people don't go into partnerships um, unless there's like a limited liability partnership, because a partnership, if something goes wrong, for example, if, if like, like for a company, for example, a company can go into administration, but with a, a partnership, like if someone, if someone like goes bankrupt, then that's on all of the partners. So if Larry owes someone like a hundred million or something, like, that's they're coming for all the partners that's that's why people don't go for partner because they're like the people don't go for partnership because you're all like the bailiffs are coming to each of our houses but, but saying that because we had just kind of first started we're like let's start a partnership let's formalize things um we were still learning we were still learning we didn't know anything about business <laughs> we were kind of asking people trying to um find out and then we uh, like found out that partnership there's less kind of paperwork and there's a lot less things to do so like yeah less work perfect but as we're kind of learning more about business we're quickly realizing that this is like really dangerous um if anything kind of goes wrong so we're in the process of kind of switching our our, our business model yeah <clears throat> that sounds re- reasonable um so you've you know you've now got this crazy opportunity and i think this is the exciting one of the most exciting things perhaps that's happened to Poor Collective. Um, I know you guys have had successes already in the last two years that have propelled you to the position to get this, but um, you're currently now, kind of, is it, is it long listed or short listed for a short major listed, competition? Short listed, short listed yeah. for a uh, major competition um, to refurbish part of the Barbican. <laughs> yeah. uh, so tell us a little bit about that opportunity, how that came about. What did you have to do to get this opportunity and and what the kind of the structure is with you teaming up with Bjork Ingalls of all people I think before we go before we get into that I think we've got to go back a little bit because I think there's something here about raising your profile um and actually being visible because I think there's loads of people that are doing amazing work and I've always said this I've always said this to people it's not about being the most talented or the most hardworking, because there's people that are way more talented than me. There are people that are way more hardworking than I am as well. Uh, like I've always been around people that are much better than me. But it's about people actually seeing what you're doing. <laughs> That's why you're always, I, I'm always trying to show people I'm doing this, I'm going in here, I'm doing this, and connecting with people, networking. Like I remember at the RCA, everyone used to laugh like, oh, you should be the networking rep. You're always going to events. But then that's how you build up your profile. I mean, that's how you meet people. And then that's how those people that you meet, they can help you. Because advice to someone um, 
that might seem like a very small point could really be something that's massive for you. And I think for us, it was about us kind of raising our profile, um, like going to events, meeting loads of people, connecting with people, um, showcasing, and also using every opportunity that was there. Because before we had had our first project, we had to get people to kind of trust us to, to uh, actually do a project. I think that's very difficult if you don't know loads of people. If you know a lot of people, then someone might be like, you know what, we can give them this very small project and then you progressively grow. And I think that's over the two years. That's what we've done. We've kind of started off with small projects, started off doing workshops, being in bigger teams. Um, and then eventually, like as our attractions have our attraction has grown, um, people have started to, to recognize us. But in saying that, I do think I think this advice for every anyone that wants to set up their own kind of collective or business. I think what really helped us, um, and again, I got a shout out, Neil Onions, is we spent months. And this is no exaggeration. Our mission and vision took us months to write. Months. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. What is our organization about? Longer than our name. What are, what are we trying to do? What work are we trying to do? Who are we working with? Now that took months of meetings, like every week. What are we trying to do? Who are we? Just so that people could come to us and know what, what kind of services we deliver. And I think that's what has helped us because people know we work with young people, we want to empower young people. Um, like three of us have architectural skills. Like we, we're creative. Like we want to co-design with young people. So that is super clear, but because we've spent months doing that. And I think that combined with us going out, networking and meeting people, that helped people to start being like, you know what, maybe, maybe we give poor opportunity. And so as we... Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, no, go ahead. And as we gradually kind of did more projects, I think people started to think, you know what, maybe we can get them to 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 do this, or maybe they can join us in this competition. Um, or maybe, maybe they'll be good in 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 this workshop or or on this project. And I think gradually it slowly kind of grew and we kind of started to carve away um and a space for ourselves because I think what we're doing is very specific and it should be i hope should be quite clear what okay, we're so, trying to so, do so what what do you do so i mean our our vision is a world where young people see no limit and our mission is um that poor collective focuses on, um, on the elevation of young people i mean focus on the development of communities for the elevation of young people so i think what we do essentially is empower young people like whilst you're seeing uh, creative uh, kind of projects and creative outlets like what we actually do is empower young people and develop communities that's what that's at the crux of what we do but at the moment we're doing that through our our skills so through architecture through co-design through engaging and 10 years from now so in 10 years in 10 years time we want like we want to be doing everything we want to be developing communities through finance um philosophy psychology, chemistry. We want to completely expand the remit of, of, of a world where young people see no limit because within our vision and mission, it doesn't say anything that says we want young people to be architects. Like that was intentional. Like this is just the first step. This is the first step of Poor Collective. Um, so in like 10 years time, we're going to completely redevelop what we mean what we mean by elevating young people amazing it's it's amazing man um again yeah i i i, I think we're gonna have to have more conversations okay. i think uh on on camera and off camera um but to save to save this running way too long because i know i have the propensity to, to take conversations <laughs> crazy lengths uh what happened for you to then you know now you're in a, i mean i love the idea by the way that you know you're you're focusing on your mission statement and you're allowing it to be a flexible and adaptable thing which is something i've learned uh from sort of developing two worlds design as a brand because like i said it started off as a clothing line <laughs> um it's had to do a lot of jumping around and then so i suppose you know right now you're exploring architecture because you guys are in that field um 
you're exploring it to the extent of winning jobs, <laughs> like yeah. potentially refurbishing the Barbican. So it's it's serious crossed. business, mate. You know, um, it's, t- talk to me about that. How did so, you get that opportunity? So, what like as we were kind of building more traction, we were getting invited to by bigger organisations to like collaborate um, on for competitions and I think we're in a very interesting time now um, because a lot of organizations are looking for ways that they can show social value and of course the work that we're doing is specifically targeting social value and community so a lot of practices have been quite interested in like the work that we've been doing I remember like when I first had these ideas before poor collective has started a lot of people like oh wow that that yeah architecture kind of needs that and people keep saying like yeah this would be great in architecture and like we would hear this and we wouldn't really like we didn't really think like this would be a massive kind of thing that people will really take to we thought yeah it's a good idea and i think we personally thought that it would be good but we didn't think people would look at it and think yeah this would be great and we just thought we wanted to do something to give back but as we started loads of people started contacting us they're like yeah it'll be great to um collaborate like it'll be great like we don't know how to speak to young people we don't know how to so these, get young people so these are practices that are reaching out so, to you on email and stuff so pra- practices will contact us and be like oh would you be interested in helping us with this workshop um, and then at the time we were like yeah because we or or like people that we knew would invite us and be like oh would you be interested in helping with this and be like yeah that would be great um so we just kept like do you doing think, these kind of sorry to keep interrupting but do you think this is part this is as a result of just from being on social media and like the posts you guys are doing and um obviously you've done kind of small scale i imagine some sort of self-funded projects as well mm. um where you have an, maybe I think you've, you've done architecture installations as well, haven't yeah. you? So all yeah. of these kind of like little token projects and all of the social media energy that you guys bring to the table, mm-hmm. is it this ammunition that is uh, kind of giving you those little bits of opportunities that you're describing? I think it's a little bit, everything is a little bit of the fact that we're like quite well connected, like we network a lot. There's also the fact that we like, we've got a few projects now, um, I mean, we work hard as well. Like, like we we'll work really hard and we're really passionate. So people like take to that. We're always trying to give a bit more, give ideas. Um, I think also the fact that our messaging is quite clear. I think our kind of brand style. We try, we try to develop that, and make all of these things quite clear. Like we try to like take good pictures of things um, as well. So I think on the outside, a lot of even though we're we're still like emerging, a lot of people will be like, yeah, they look like they know what they're trying to do. Um, so let's let's give them opportunity. And I think we kind of increasingly saw people kind of saying, like, you know what, let's give them let's give them an opportunity. And most of the big practices would say the same thing. Like there was an architect before them that gave them an opportunity. And depending on how they dealt with that opportunity, they kept giving their opportunities. So for us, when we were getting opportunities, we made sure that we worked hard. <laughs> like every opportunity we worked hard, like we came, like we came on time, like we hit deadlines. Um, we didn't like, we didn't waste anyone's time. So as we kept doing that and our visibility kind of uh, kept, um, and people kept seeing like poor collector, poor collector, poor collector. I think more practices started coming to us um, and then I think, like, as practices started to come to us, I remember our first big bid that we were on was with HTA for Thamesmead. And that was a colander bid. And I remember, like, after seeing that, a lot of people were like, oh, wow, you guys are on these bids. And I think that unlocked, like, a whole new kind of network where people were like, oh, poor collective, they do this. Or we, we didn't know that they're actually... Like, we just thought they did workshops. We didn't realise they did all of these other stuff. Like, we just well, thought they went into schools. <laughs> well, it's amazing, isn't it? So are you telling me you guys are being brought in as, like, the wider, as part of the design team, the design, the consultation team, um, as sub-consultants specialising in the social value aspect of projects? Yeah, so now in, so, like, we're, like, people are coming and approaching us saying, do you want to be part of the design team? Um, because our whole thing is that, like it's not only it's, it's not only about like the workshops and the co-design it's is about th- like the young people and the community having something tangible so our whole thing is that we're not just kind of 
saying, okay, this young person did this. We want something tangible. We want, whether it's an installation, whether it's a mural, whether it's a small structure, whether play it's a space. building, yeah. a, a play space, we want something tangible. So and so, I, so I, I, I like to understand, because, you know, you we're both doing our part threes as well. So, you know, it's very fascinating. I mean, I think your, probably, your, your, your case study is probably going to be like a <laughs> mosaic, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Uh, it is fascinating so like you're you know i can imagine from from a project point of view you know a major i worked on a major skyscraper in london um that's still in the works and you know we we brought in um various consultants to help with obviously the public realm is going to have to incorporate play space because obviously you have a podium for a massive giant tower the podium space is going to have to incorporate all of the london plans policies to do with uh, making sure that the public realm is activated for you know public use the local community getting access to play space is an actual solid requirement by councils now so um, is it in that area because I could see I could really see it working especially if you've got the architecture background where you know how to you know draw plans and and create spatial spatially sensitive uh, outcomes um, where you know you'd be brought into the project to create that play space and create that provision for uh, the youth, not just, you know, like you say, the maybe the tangible and maybe the ornamental things, but but the program as well that could potentially take place within those uh, offerings inside and outside. I think I think it's multifaceted because on one side, on one side it's is like we've got architectural skills so a lot of practices when they're bringing in consultants for like public realm it isn't it might not necessarily even be a designer it might be someone that um is within the community that can bring together the community but then it's like what that person has like the what that person might say the architect has to interpret that in some kind of way and maybe they might not necessarily be able to relate to that person so with us, when we're talking about kind of marginalized communities or um, like inner city areas, we feel as if we could connect with those people, but we could also draw up what we actually think they want. Mm. Um, so we're actually really taking what what they what they kind of want and believe, and we're taking that. But then it's not only that because, for the most part, I feel like public realm a lot of the time is about like thinking about the public and kind of serving them but we're not only trying to do it we're trying to up, like upskill them in the process upskill so we them. want them to the, the, the like the local community that we're working with for the people in the in, in the right. in the in the area we don't want because how we see it is when you've got a massive team of so many consultants so many designers and you're telling me someone's coming and there's a development in your area there's a young person that's never seen a developer before why can't we connect them with that developer? Why can't we connect them with a fire consultant or an m and &E engineer? It doesn't take much. It doesn't, it doesn't take much. And we're seeing increasingly um, practices with the, when they're trying to show their social value, they, they have to do these things. And I think for us, it's not, it's not just that they have to and it's a tick box exercise. It's like, this is an opportunity. There's an opportunity for you to, to really give back. And a lot of the time, the people that, uh, are given back they actually they're like wow this is great like why why weren't we doing this before like now we're seeing someone we've got someone that's really passionate instead of just getting someone that just wants to work here um so for us it, it there's loads of stuff there's loads of stuff they're not only about kind of just speaking to the communities about giving them opportunities going there trying to understand them getting them involved because i think that's how you really create a, a, a valuable project now i can see potential friction in 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 what you're describing, which is uh, the increase in the ideal scenario, right? If we're talking about best architecture practice and all the ethics that we have to fulfill and the responsibilities, this is, you're talking about, this is the gold standard, what you're talking about here. We all know the real world doesn't work like that though. Mm. And, you know, the developer mindset exists and the, 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 um, uh, the trophy building culture exists. Mm. And these people, they just want to, they just want to tick the box for the number, the percentage of affordable space given, the percentage of play space provided, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't know how how what's the biggest practice you've worked with and and, and what are the kind of frictions you've seen already? 
the biggest practice probably currently big I big think now yeah probably the well but um, i suppose what's the have you faced any friction yet because i can see there's there'd probably be a lot more acceptance from smaller firms with your services um, especially because i can imagine larger practices wouldn't want the uh, any part of the consultant team to kind of mm-hmm. almost take take too much control or authority over the project and start to generate more energy into what they would see as a very small facet of the design process, which is public realm and offering and youth Mm. for them. That's just one piece of a giant Mm. puzzle that they need to fit fix. I think, I think for us, we'd be quite either. We'd be fortunate or we missed out on opportunities. Cause if we, if we feel as if we're being a piece of a puzzle, um, like one piece of a thousand piece puzzle, like we don't want to be a part of that puzzle. We don't want to be a part of, um, a team where like oh yeah we're gonna just tick tick this box and like we're gonna leave you guys like because I think that also that tarnishes what we're trying to actually do and I think if if we were in a position where we had said all of these things and a practice had decided you know we don't care about all this stuff I think we probably would just simply remove ourselves yeah. from the project yeah. especially because we've all worked in practice and we have seen the other side how how these things can be in practice and like you know what we're doing it, but we actually don't care about it. Um, Like we don't want that for our own organization. So So that that, that initial meeting is going to be the make or break, isn't it? Literally the initial meeting will be, we'll like, we'll lay out all of our cards on the table and say, look, this is what we want to do. And sometimes we might get email and be like, oh, we found someone else. Yeah. But then it's like, that's sometimes that's how the it's cookie good. crumbles. Well, it's a, it's a very simple response and a good response to what I thought was a complex issue, but it's, it's actually not because, you know, although, although yes, it's a very, uh, it could be seen as a very small part of the design process for some practices. And I think I, I hinted at that, that obviously a smaller practice would feel that the social drive is the whole project. Yeah. It is it is the entire vision. So bringing on specialists in that area, especially if it's directed to youth, is going to be a very highly valuable thing. Mm-hmm. And and by the way, you know, if you don't if you don't know, but this podcast is about looking at the multidisciplinary potential of architecture and looking at, you know, I love this story that you know you've come from the typical architecture background, mm-hmm. you've but you've added this flavor of something else and mm-hmm. it's diversified your services. Mm-hmm. It's incredible because the services you offer are not always to be sat there doing CAD plans, but yeah. you're there as a social consultant. Mm-hmm. But I do have to say, and I do have to give some credit to the Royal College of Art. I mean, no, no, don't give credit the, to anyone. It's, it's I, mean, you, <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the 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 bar of entry is ridiculous. <laughs> and for anyone that doesn't know, I had to get two scholarships to go there. So wow. <laughs> that's the only reason I got in. Um, but so are you giving they, credit or are you discrediting them? <laughs> I'm giving them credit for the education I got once I was there. But the fact that it was so many hurdles to get there like and i think this is for everyone to to recognize because i know a lot of people look at the rca and think it's unattainable if there's a will there's a way like i remember getting my my place there and i was so happy then the first thing at work they were like how are you gonna afford it and i'm just like i don't know i'm just gonna have to work it out but saying that when i was actually there they did what they taught me was that the skills that we have we don't need to limit ourselves. So they, they, if anything, I think they taught me how to think more than how to design. I mean, my tutors will probably hate this, <laughs> but they really taught me how to, how to think outside of the normal conventions. And I think that's why me, Ben and Larry work so well together because we're not only thinking about architecture, we're thinking about this tools that we have as, as future architects and how we can make a positive impact in the world. And I think that's where our kind of massive ambitions come from. It's not only about, okay, we can build a youth center. No, why can't we build a build a youth center with a program to uplift the young people and then the young people go on to run the youth center and they open their own youth center off the back of that. Like, so it, it just, it, it, it's not one thing. It's like we've got thousands of ideas coming out of one kind of design idea. So I think mm. that's where like like our thinking is quite different from like 
other people. And that's why we didn't want to just set up like an architecture, a pr- architecture practice. Yeah. It's amazing. I, I, I have just realized we have not answered the question yet of, um, oh, so, so, of so, sorry. No, no, it's, it's my fault. I think <laughs> I've been going on tangents it, about, you know, the, how did the, the Barbican opportunity come to your doorstep? So as I kind of mentioned before about the colander bid um, before, I think that kind of raised our profile quite a bit. And then there was a competition for the Liverpool waterfront. Um, and we got, we got asked by Big if we, like, if we wanted to join the team. And we were like, what, what, why would we kind of, us, this, this is crazy. This, this, is, this, this, this is incredible. So you just got Big. a random email by, by, by Big. So they they were said that they were going forward um, for for the project and like they wanted to like they're b- building a team. So they had our mentor Neil Onions with Beyond the Box there. They had Jaden um, Ali on the team, um, and I'm sure I'm positive they probably won't admit. I'm sure they put in some good words about us. Um, and yeah, we got we got brought into a team. But then again, I think this is important for everyone kind of setting up their own organization is when you get that opportunity, it's go time. So like when we were in those meetings, we were trying to we were trying to contribute as much as possible. We were trying to like give our two pence. We were, we were saying what we believe um the project should like what we should do with the product, how we should engage with the local community, what we should do with the young people, how we can like really revitalize um the waterfront. And I think for a lot of people, that's quite daunting. It's like we're looking at people that have been working um, in their respected uh, kind of areas for for like at least a decade, if not longer. And we're here with a new organisation um, that at the time, I believe, wasn't even two, two years old. And we're trying to kind of give our opinion. I think everyone has valuable opinions because everyone's life experiences are different. So when we were in those meetings, we were thinking, no, we've got something to say. We want to do this. And I think we really worked hard um, on that on that bid. I mean, we got shortlisted. Um, we, we didn't win, but I think that process really helped us. So when the Barbican um, bid came round, because we had kind of like worked really well, I think Big just were like, you know what? We need a cool pour up again. So, so there was a. You reckon there was probably, and again, this shows the power of networking and the power of kind of putting your yourself out there. And I always talk about, you know, it, it can feel very daunting, isn't it, to self promote all the time. But once I change my mindset and realize it's self documentation, yeah. then then it, it just changed my mind frame that look, I'm not doing something that's incredibly, um, you know narcissistic what i'm actually doing exactly. is is i'm i'm just documenting my value and 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 it 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 shows right you got the email from yeah. bjark ingle so um so once you got that email that was as as a kind of a gesture to invite you to join their team yeah and then they invited you for meetings to come and sit with them and sh- and say here's the brief here's the competition what do you propose so yeah so literally at the moment like we're working, um, we're working with them, and yeah, I mean, I can't say too much about like the proposal, or everything, but yeah, we're work, we're going back and forth, and we're thinking about how we wanna we wanna tackle um, the renewal moving forward. So, but you said you didn't win. Is the results already out? So no, no, that was that was for so what what at the moment for the barbican renewal we're shortlisted yeah but for the liverpool waterfront yeah we didn't win so we got oh so the liverpool waterfront came first with big. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ah, and then you maintain the connection. They saw you guys were, yeah. good, were really good, so they brought you back in for, for Barbican. For the Barbican, yeah, exactly. So And now you're shortlisted. So, yeah, so despite not despite not winning, I think there's a lesson here that can be learned. Is like, despite not winning, we were on the team and we worked well together. We worked hard. Um, so they, they contacted us again. Yeah, a lot of these, the thing about winning and losing, I realise as well, is it's, it's often not, most of the time it's not about how good you are there's there's so many other factors that come yeah, into play definitely. especially with something as complex like a, an architecture competition or bid yeah. um and let's not get into undercutting and procurement issues <laughs> and whatnot um but this is incredibly exciting this is this is going to take you guys to a whole new level um 
And, uh, you know, just before we kind of close off the conversation, um, you know, give us a little, what can you tell us? A little bit of juice, you know, like, I, I, mean, mean, I know there's a lot of confidential stuff. Yeah, I mean, what I can say is that the Barbican is massively going to change. I mean, if you look at the stuff that they're trying to do in terms of the cultural Mao um, and all of the kind of cultural aspects that the City of London are trying to do, like they're trying to make the whole area an international location where we're going to be bringing in some of the world's best um, artists, thinkers, designers. So it is, it's, in, it's incredible. Some of the ideas that they have is... Is, is literally incredible is it going to remain social housing mainly so in terms of in terms of like the, is that part of your like, proposals i mean we can't obviously we can't say about the proposals but i mean the, like the other teams maybe they might want to change the kind of social housing they might want to change different things i mean like I you gotta you be would. as radical you, you gotta be as radical as 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 you think is is necessary in these competitions because if you think about it the time of the Barbican original competition, if you look at, go back to some of the proposals, they were like a pyramid. Someone proposed like a, a pyramid on the site. So I think you've got to, you've got to be um, quite radical, but then at the same time, um, you've got to think the sensitivities, the Barbican, like how, like how, how respected it is. Do you really want to kind of try and alter aspects of, of one of the most kind of iconic buildings in london if not the uk so let's be honest you can't you guys can't do too much to the to the brutalistic base and foundations of it all can you what what's well, big what's big trying to do i'm i'm, I'm, I'm well <laughs> look i'm telling you these proposals you might think you might not be able to do much like the winner proposal you might like might see something that you that you weren't too sure that you were gonna see <laughs> is he doing a tower <laughs> you're too good mate we, we won't get anything out of you um, I can't. but before i get struck enough and like sure i, I, I emailed like, sure, confidential <laughs> <laughs> nah, you've been good mate you've been good um, i don't want to get you in trouble so no thanks so much for your time man i think it was a nice way to kind of cap it off to show you know look at the power that you've been able mm-hmm. to to gain look at the, the 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 kind of the journey you've been on all out of restriction and um <laughs> and now this is just the beginning hmm. fingers crossed man's young fingers crossed. the fingers crossed and yeah. the age of, of 27 and um fingers fingers I'm, crossed I, I'm, I'm deeply excited by kind of staying connected with you as well and, and hopefully we can collaborate on stuff and um yeah there's more to be talked about as well yeah definitely i think to everyone that's going to be listening i think it's important to kind of it's not like you said, it's not about kind of going on LinkedIn and being like, I'm going to, I'm narcissistic and I want to show everything to everyone because I'm the best. It's about showing what you're doing so there's visibility so people can see what you're doing, so people can contact you, you can connect with people. Because if you don't, if you don't show what you're doing, how are people going to know? Like, and I think it's also about connecting, does it like meeting people, speaking to people, going on on podcasts like if you get invited like I mean it's great it's great like but as you raise your profile people be interested in what in what what you do and people will kind of take to you and if you've got an interesting story like tell it don't like if you see me on LinkedIn you should be posting more than me I'm sure you've got interesting stuff I want to see what you guys are doing um but I think it's also about connecting with people don't be scared to ask I'm, I'm always saying to people if you need any help or there's stuff I can help with I'll try to my best of my knowledge because there are loads of people that I just contacted and they helped me. I think at, we're at a, such an interesting time. It's time to connect, work together with other people and we're going to be the future of the design sector, fingers crossed. <laughs> that, is, that is a beautiful way to end it. And, and, and that is a thought that, that does, maybe I'm getting scared too much. Everything's scary <laughs> to me, but it is scary. You know, I, you know I'm starting to feel like an adult now I think it's about time and I'm starting to feel I say that having had a kid and <laughs> been married for, <laughs> for four or five years now uh, it was a bit worrying um, no it's just you know I see these people around me and I'm starting to see success stories of people my age and it just gives me such joy to see people kind of leveling up and making big moves and it hits me it has hit me in the same way you're describing that 
we are the future man and it's it's a future i'm very hopeful for and i'm very excited about same same we're the future <laughs> thanks so much sean no worries god bless you yeah and <laughs> see you guys in the next episode <laughs>